Here's a, a video of a construction worker working on a lead edge. Uh, I think again, I need to copy this. And use a different uh, browser. In the U.S., more than 800 construction workers die every year while on the job. Falls are the number one cause of fatalities in construction. Falls cause one of every three construction worker deaths. These falls happen in a split second while workers are on roofs, scaffolds, ladders, bridges, and other work surfaces. But these deaths can be prevented. The video you're about to see shows how quickly falls at construction sites can lead to... <clears throat> we lost the uh, internet connection maybe? Oh, it's buffering. Oh. It could be the buffer, yeah. Hundred construction workers die every year while on the job. Okay. Falls are the number one cause of fatalities in construction. Falls cause one of every three construction worker deaths. These falls happen in a split second while workers are on roofs, scaffolds, ladders, bridges, and other work surfaces. But these deaths can be prevented. The video you're about to see shows how quickly falls at construction sites can lead to workers' deaths. The video will also show what employers must do so that the work can be done more safely. Employers have a responsibility to provide a safe workplace and required protective equipment. You'll see that using the right type of fall protection saves lives. Please be advised, the scenes you're about to see deal with deaths at construction sites and might be disturbing for some people. All scenes are based on true stories. Four workers were insulating the roof and applying the top layer of sheet metal roof decking on a tall pre-engineered building. The roof was fairly flat, there was no controlled decking zone, and the workers were not wearing any personal fall protection. The workers were using drills to screw the metal sheets into the purlins. As one of the workers walked down the roof, he lost his footing. He fell through the space between the purlins and landed on the floor below. He died the next day from his injuries. Let's look at the events that led up to this tragic incident and see how it could have been prevented. Originally, the workers had no fall protection, which OSHA requires the employer to provide when working at heights of 15 feet and above. Let's look again at the workers installing the metal roofing sheets and see what happens when these workers use fall protection. They are now using a temporary horizontal lifeline. This involves a horizontal cable attached to two or more anchor points on the roof. In this system, the workers connect their harnesses to a horizontal lifeline that is secured to the roof structure instead of individual anchor points. Again, as the worker loses his footing and falls between the purlins, his lifeline stops him from falling to the floor below. While he is hanging from his fall arrest system, a co-worker brings over a lift and rescues the worker. This example shows the importance of employers following OSHA's fall protection standards to ensure that workers are provided with a safe workplace. These types of construction deaths are preventable. The fall protection measures shown here save workers' lives. Use fall protection on the job. It could be the difference between life and death. If you would like more information, contact OSHA at www.osha.gov or one 800 321 OSHA. That's 1 800 321 6742. Any comments on that video? That's a yo yo. Exactly. <laughs> That's a yo yo. That's a self retractive <laughs> line that they were using over there. And the, 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 the roof I was working in Venezuela was very similar to that one. I wasn't installing the the, the, the sheet metal, I was putting an antenna on top of that. But anyway. Alright, uh, here's uh, pictures of the guardrails. We have the top rail, the mid rail, and the tow board. Top rails must be between 39 and 45 inches tall. Tow boards should be at least uh, three and a half uh, inches high. And they are there to protect uh, employees that are working below from tools or 
equipment or materials that may be going against the uh, edge to prevent them from falling down and heat uh, somewhere. What do you think? Is this a good uh, guardrail? No. Is it open? No. No, all right. Plus, the, uh, the angle should have been on the other end. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, it's backwards, right? It's uh, it's just all no engineering. <laughs> and there's uh, no uh, tow board over there. Okay, great. So that's uh, we we talk about the guardrails now. These are uh, safety net systems. These are nets like they use on the circus to you know protect people from <coughs> falling down. <coughs> so <coughs> you want to install the, a net that will cut uh, the individual if they fall. Now, uh, as you fall from, from above uh, and you are falling down, the, the, the further down that you fall, the farther away from the edge of the building that you may be. So you need to install the guardrail, the, the safety net system in such way that uh, you move away from the edge eight feet, if you're five feet below the working surface, 10 feet if you're 5 to 10, or 13 feet if you're more than uh, 10 feet uh, below. So uh, it's uh, something like this, you know, if, if you're falling down, uh, depending on where you place your net, you want to be a little bit further away from the building. Now, that uh, safety net has also need to be tested to make sure that it works and it will protect an employee who's falling. So the, the drop test is basically taking a, a uh, 400 pound bag of sand and then throw it uh, onto the net to make sure that it will, it will work and will not uh, you know, hurt the individual. Uh, another interesting or important uh, consideration with this uh, safety net system and also with the fall arrest system is that you should not put any kind of uh, uh, material or store material underneath that net because then the person can fall and hit that uh, material rather than being safely uh, you know, rescued by the system. So you, you have to take that into consideration. Here some more uh, restrictions about the safety net. Uh, defective nets should, go, should not be used, of course. They should be inspected uh, for wear and tear, make sure that uh, they're in a good operating condition. The size of the mesh should not exceed six inches by six inches. Uh, you know, it should be strong and, 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 and in good uh, conditions. Here's a picture of a safety net used uh, to protect workers on, on a roof uh, installation. These, uh, they, these nets, of course, they, they assume that the person is falling down and they want to cut that individual from, from uh, the fall. Okay, uh, ensure that personal fall resistance will, will do the following while stopping a person from falling. Limit the, the maximum arrest force to 1,800 pounds. You know, when, when you're falling, your, your weight is going to take uh, acceleration because of uh, gravity. And when you're pulled back to, to hold you, there's going to be a force in your body um, because of the fall arrest system. So the, the maximum force should be 1,800 pounds. That's why um, fall arrest system have a, a, a section on it. It's a uh, shock absorber. So it will break, it will fall, and it will slow down your, your uh, fall. So you, you're subject to a lower force. But that means that you also need more clearance uh, while working because you, you, the, the length of that uh, line yard will be extended by the shock absorber. Be read uh, such that an employee can neither free fall more than six feet or contact any lower level. Bring an employee to a complete stop limit, uh, maximum deceleration distance to three and a half feet. 
have sufficient strength to withstand twice the potential impact energy of a worker falling from a distance of six feet or the free fall distance from the system. <coughs> um, I want to uh, go ahead and, and, and show you a tool to calculate uh, fall uh, arrest distances. This is done by Miller for let's see, Miller for protection. Let's see, Miller, yeah. These guys, meterforprotection.com, uh, they have uh, fall arrest systems uh, and, and um, protection from falls. That's their their uh, core business. So they have different designs on these uh, fall arrest systems. Some of those are, you know, more comfortable than others to, uh, you know, make make employees. Uh, more comfortable when they're wearing these devices. And they have this uh, fall clearance calculator. So it's basically, it says, okay, if you're using a land yard, the um, land yard length is eight inches, the connection height is six. Uh, the, so you, you, it has a, a uh, description of you know what is the the height that the operation is going to be working on the length of the line yard and then you know you have the the height so it provides uh, a graphical representation of that uh, installation if you have a self retractable line you know this is a what happened you have the employee working at, at a height that person can move on and then fall down. So it does give you here a clearance that you have uh, for that employee. You know. So yeah, that, that, that's a, an interesting uh, site. Uh, again, this is uh, Miller for protection. <clears throat> The other, uh, the other consideration that you have when using these fall systems is, you know, how to rescue that person when, when that person falls. Because uh, they, they will be subject to tension on the body, you know, that the, the harness is going to create tension on, on the uh, legs, the arms, and this can cause uh, circulation problems. So you can't leave that person hanging over there forever. That that, that will cause uh, clogs in the blood and uh, some other health issues. So you need to have a way to um, rescue that person right away. Have any one of you had uh, experience with somebody that has fallen and need to be rescued? Yes, you want to talk a little bit about it? There's a swing stage or a suspended scaffolding on the outside of a hotel in uh, South Beach and um, he tried to hit the emergency stop because there was a malfunction on one of the motors typically there's two motors on these swing stations there's two people on it uh, and there was a malfunction he tried to hit the emergency stop and the emergency stop didn't stop either so the other gentleman was able to hit his stop so the swing stage did this this gentleman was still kind of sitting where the swing stage stopped but this other gentleman had the swing stage go out from under him and he was left suspended the problem was where he was left suspended is that there was no sliding glass windows or anything. And he was up like on the 18th story. Uh, so what ended up happening was we sent somebody up to the top to make sure that his anchorage was, everything was tight, nothing was loose. And then eventually what happened was the other guy was close enough to a balcony where we got him off on a balcony. And then <clears throat> when you're left suspended like this, your hook is all the way up there. So even if you you would have to like literally climb up to unhook yourself to come off somewhere. So someone has to relieve that tension mm -hmm. that's on you. We don't have a boom lift, our crane couldn't swing over and you know take that pressure off so that he can release himself. So <clears throat> what, we did, what we did in that case was, I told the other guy once he got off to leave his rope grab on the rope where he was at. This other gentleman who was less suspended, he had a double <clears throat> lanyard. He only had one lanyard 
hooked off to where he was. So once that guy came off, we swung that lifeline over to him and told him, hey, hook up with your other hook onto this lifeline. Yeah. And then I told so the guy at the top, and then I told the guy at the top, cut yeah. that line. Yeah. And people were like, are you crazy? I'm like, no, he's tied off to another one. Mm -hmm. So cut that one. So once they cut the one he was it's hanging off, here. no, no, he was, he was already fine. He was holding on right where his hook was. And he was able to, when we cut that, then he was able to, he left suspended and he just brought his rope right down and got off on the back. Good. But I mean, from start to finish, it was probably 15 minutes, but it seemed like an eternity. Yeah. Actually, and you see that, they, you know, you see that you, you're starting to lose the guy. So, you know, you want to keep him coherent because once he's unconscious like that, then he can't even help. Yeah, he can't help at yeah. all. Yeah, so we see a real life situation where you, you need to deal with how to, you know, rescue that person from uh, that position. Very good. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. that. Okay, uh, body belts. They were uh, acceptable some time ago. They're no longer acceptable as a fall arrest system. Uh, they could, you know, put the person in, in danger if they uh, fall and are uh, only su su suspended by the belt. Uh, do not attach uh, fall arrest system to guardrail system or hoist. Uh, break for resistance to allow movement of the worker only as far as the edge of the walking surface then uh, when used to uh, hoist areas. This is the uh, uh, hardness and it shows the location where, where uh, the back is uh, connected to the, to the uh, safety line, the lanyard. These, you know, are designed to minimize forces on, on the body, but still, you know, they, they will be subject to the tension when, when they fall. Some of these body hardness, they, they have a capability to uh, move the, the, the tension from one point to another one where, where you can move and then be sitting if you, if you fall. So you relieve the pressure on the legs. But of course, you know, different type of systems, they, they would cost... Uh, more. Here we see a person who's only tied with a, a, a uh, belt, so you can imagine this is not a safe position to be if you fall, so that's why uh, body belts are no longer uh, an acceptable way to, to, pretend, to protect people. Then uh, we have the vertical lifeline, lanyards, these are the ones that are connected to the uh, fall, uh, to the, to the uh, Hardness, they should have a minimum uh, breaking strength of 5,000 pounds to protect, you know, the person from from falling. Be protected against being caught or, uh, you know, abrasion uh, as the worker is moving. Uh, in general, you should not have two employees uh, attached to the same lifeline. Uh, but if, uh, if, if it's the case, um, during the construction of uh, elevator shafts, they do allow the two employees uh, to be connected to the same line, but, but then both employees are working atop a false guard that is equipped with guardrails. The strength of the lifeline is now 10,000 pounds, 5,000 per employee, and another lifeline criteria, um, all other lifeline criteria have been met. Okay, then uh, we talked a little bit about the yo-yos, the issue came, those, those are the self-retractive uh, lines. They should limit the free fall distance to two feet or less, must be capable of sustaining a minimum tensile load of 3,000 pounds. Um, then uh, they, they should be taken out of service after a person falls and, and, and it's, uh, you know, it becomes a, a, an issue. So I asked, you know, one of the salesmen, how do you know if they hand you a self-retracting line, how do you know that it has uh, <coughs> been used before and has, you know, saved someone's life? Because it should be taken out of uh, duty. So what he said is that when, when the person falls, this system will clamp into the line, okay, to stop that person from falling. So that's going to make a mark on the 
line. So what you should do is you should inspect your self-retracting line to make sure there is no one of those markings that will indicate it was used before to save somebody. So I thought that was an interesting way to you know know what happened. You have more experience with that than any other. Yeah, any protection? any any fall protection systems you use if they're exposed to a fall, like everything that guy was wearing that day is completely out of service. Out you of can't service. use it again. From mm -hmm. the harness to the lanyard to the rope, the rope grab, the anchor that was put into the concrete, all of that is is void now because it, it took a, an arrest. Right. Um, but you always want to open up your lanyards, especially, I mean, your your retractables, especially if they're like of synthetic webbing because they have wire rope, they have synthetic webbing ones. But typically those are the ones that get, they're cheaper, the synthetic webbing ones. Um, I don't like them because people who usually have them on are on leading edge work, either installing steel decking or wood with nails or rebar guys that are dealing with steel. So there's a lot of friction, abrasion. friction and abrasion that goes on with those and it's it's very hard to find one that doesn't have some kind of nick on it. And so what's a little nick, how much of a nick is acceptable, right. and then yeah starts. then you run into those questionable calls you got to make on a daily basis. You better off just spend a, an extra 150 bucks and getting that same retractable in a wire rope and it's a lot easier to inspect it and you know if something's wrong on it it's time to get rid of it. Right. So, very good. Any comments or questions about these things? Oh, yes. The, Go ahead, sorry. the question I have: Why you can only use it once if it's been, you know, exposed to an arrest? Yeah, if you have it on and you fall and it arrests uh, your fall, the manufacturer says it's out of service. You don't right. question a manufacturer because <laughs> if you do something. Contrary to your manufacturer, when you go to court and they say it's your employee, they're, they're going to show up, Miller Fall Arrest, and say, hey, we explicitly said if it arrested a fall, it's out of service. Yeah. Or if it's expired. Or if it's yeah. expired. It's, uh, it, it's for liability issues. It may hold another person falling, but you don't want to take the risk. It may not. Maybe some of the, uh, the, the material, because it's being exposed to a very high uh, force, can break internally and, and you don't see it, but it's broken. So the second time, it may not be able to sustain that amount of uh, tension. You know, so that, that, that's the reason. And there's yeah. another reason. Maybe I, I run, but the, uh, the liners sometimes serve as a caution. They are in some, um, at the end, they have like a, some... Um, uh, the shock absorption. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when you fall, you, you just uh, go straight, if, and then you can't use it anymore. Yeah, and of course. That, mark over there. that one, that that's another reason. Yeah, the, in that case, uh, you, you have a a packet that is exactly. to support the to, to to break down a little bit the fall. So that packet will, will break and open to hold the the, the person, you know, to mm -hmm. to prevent the high force to be set at once. So after that's broken, then you, you can't use it anymore because you can't repack it and, and tie it again. It's like, a, you know, it's not like, like one of these uh, uh, parachutes that you can put back together. This one, you can't. You have to throw it away. Yeah, the, the way they tie it is like they sew it with this. And, and as pressure is applied, it's, it's releasing and it's holding you. So right. if you put a bunch of cardboard or boxes in and you put one and on top of the and, and the air is the one that is, is holding you. Yeah. The, the what's the? I mean, this seems like it's extremely costly. Uh, I can understand why he as a as a GC wouldn't be providing it and say like you know it's up to the the, the, side the contract. Well, it's not it's costing. We, you won't you don't do provide it. it for liability. Yeah. No. Yeah. The thing is, when we were taking the estimating class, this was. I mean, now that I'm looking back and seeing uh, what we were looking at in terms of the cost, if if that same roof system, we're trying to think of the cost of putting that roof. I mean, I saw four massive poles going up and lines connecting onto each pole. Yeah. And I would imagine you're extending that each time you're going up another floor. So the cost associated with providing this sort of wall protection. It seems like it, it would be quite significant. Right, and, and it's important to take that into consideration, you know. Some contractors may not be considering 
they fall the red system and then when you over there you need to, to, to provide it. So from what pocket is going to come? Right. From the one that didn't calculate that and say, oh my God, this goes out from my profit. Right? Yeah. Well, I could, do I could understand how like shortcuts would start coming in and to the safety exactly. because if you've estimated the project and this was not in your mind, when you're actually building it and you get OSHA issues you're becoming aware of and you're, you're starting to put it in, it, you don't do it. And in the end, violations. And then violations, they would cost you more. That, that how you cut it? You cut it in the materials? Or you, cut in the you can have that in general requirements because uh, it's something, it's, it's, uh, it can be considered an overhead because you, you have you know, you, you have to install but you don't provide it to the customer. You take it back with you when the job is done. And you can have different types of uh, water resistance. So, you know, that that's a, a consideration to make. Maybe one uh, contractor will have, you know, nets and and, uh, and and safety lines and another one may have just uh, anchor points. You, know, you have to provide some sort of uh, a protection. So the, like the, gu the guardrails is what kind of also brought into mind. If you yeah. if you have multiple floors, you're gonna eventually put balconies, and you're gonna have you know railings. You're gonna put on it right. in the end. Anyway, yeah, so, so that kind of like maybe uh, what you prioritize. Maybe put certain things up first, and it's kind of working as your fall protection and your and your final your, product, your actual yeah. final product, because right. you're almost like building things twice in a way first. So right, so right. Like, so those are part of the good, but then. Then many times what happens is that if you're putting the final product, it gets when you come in, when, <laughs> when you come in, when you when I come in from my punch list and I see a nick, I say take it out, replace, it. replace yeah. it with a new one, you know, exactly. with an undamaged one. Yeah. So then that becomes expensive. When I when I was overseas, uh, as part of the uh, cost breakdown and the schedule of values, there was a line called industrial hygiene. And industrial okay. ID was safety. So you had a, a, a line item, you had to provide it in all the projects. Okay. You know what a lot of people do though when they provide that pricing, if they know that they're submitting mm -hmm. pricing to mm -hmm. a JC or a contractor who holds safety in high regard, they'll leave that safety line item in there. If it's a smaller job where they know yeah. that it's an industry where they don't care, like residential home building, mm -hmm. they just will all scratch my safety line item just so I can compete and get the job. But on the bigger jobs where they know that you're adamant about safety, they'll leave the safety line on them in there, say thirty thousand, forty thousand mm dollars. -hmm. But there's really not money they use on safety. They use right. it for other stuff. Right. So but mm -hmm. when they present it to you, so then you know, they get caught with their pants down after it's like where's the third where have you spent your thirty thousand right. dollars in safety out here? Right. Yeah. right. No, 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 no. I, I remember that that was a that was the number in which you cut down the price. That's the so first it, number. That people was the cut. first number you cut yeah. down on, on the bedding. They're like, you know what I was gonna put netting? But you know now I'm just going to give each person an individual yeah, anchor individual. point, or you know what I'm not even going to do fall protection. I'm going to just hire one guy at eight dollars an hour, and he's going to be the monitor yeah, right. to tell people if yeah. they're close to an edge. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah, you had a comment. It is an interesting point because uh, going back to Plaza South, 26 story building, 260 linear feet of temporary rail, and the other building was 31 stories tall. 120 temporary uh, rail. When the company did the bid, they never think about it. And they had to swallow all the cost to yeah, move the, yeah. the old walls, build the temporary walls, wait till at the, do, the, do all the repairs, do the finish, set the railing back, the new railings, and then for the next building, Playa del Mar, they just have to start thinking about how much it will cost to build the temporary grave. Right. And they learn, and they right? They add to the <laughs> removal the installation of the temporary grave. It is a very good point. Yeah, very good point. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, they, but, they learn and then they. But the cost, <gasps> the it cost them. Lost a lot. They, we of lost money. Yeah. Every wall that we remove, we lost money. Because of the temporary grave. Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you what, somebody falls. Well, that's that's, that's a problem with safety. You can't no, quantify what doesn't happen. Right. You know what that's a problem yeah, with that's our industry. You can't quantify what happens. So you could say you lost money. Exactly. You could have lost your company, your reputation, and somebody's life. And the other thing is they, they thought at the beginning that they can do the temporary rail with the with the ropes, with the tension with the cables, ropes, with cables and mm -hmm. ropes. Then we start doing that. Impossible. On 260 linear feet, it's impossible. Then we have to start just doing the, the temporary rail two by two.
trick. You guys want to take a short break?